Uh, our next founder is pretty much a genius. There's a really good chance that you will not understand what is being spoken about on stage. She happened to sell a company, Equalogic, for 1.4 billion in 2008, which is the middle of a recession. So pretty much she's the biggest boss here. Please welcome to the stage Paula Long of Data Gravity and our moderator, Ron Miller. Kind of loud? Yeah, <laughs> you all set there? Yeah. All right, so these are aptly called founder stories, and Paula has founded not one, but two companies. And as Jordan said, she sold the first one for $1.4 billion, which is a pretty serious amount of money. And to put that into perspective, I did some research, and it was one of only 20 IT companies in the last 10 years that sold for more than a billion dollars. So that's Pretty, pretty good company. So I'm wondering, when you were going back to 2007 and selling that company, were you actually looking to sell? Were buyers pursuing you? I mean, who, was, who made that move in that, in that dance? So this is sort of an interesting dance. Um, if you go to sec.gov, you'll see we actually filed. Our S1 was approved. Um, we closed the papers with Dell on Sunday night, and if we had not closed the papers, uh, we were doing our road show on Tuesday. So we were minutes away from being a public company. You know, the 1.4 is an impressive number. Um, I like to think about it as on $52 million raise, we were profitable. We had 4,000 customers who were happy, 98% customer sat rating, um, and we were going. We were going to go public. So we had really no intention of selling. Um, when the numbers started coming in, someone said, you know, I want to buy them for 500 million. We're, eh, let's, let's, right. let's, 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 I mean, that's a lot of money. Million, you know, what yeah, is, that's what a lot of money, but if you looked at our revenue, it wasn't that a lot of money compared to the revenue. Then the number got a B in it, and you started thinking, uh -huh. well, there's a B there. You know, if somebody offers you something with a B in it, you should think about it, right? And so, um, <laughs> tip to folks, if someone offers you something with a B in it, and you had 52 in, you might want to think about it. You might not do it, but you might want to think about it. Right. So really, that's what happened. But I think it was Michael Dell who really tipped me because he was passionate about the company, passionate about the mission, passionate about the product. I mean, he called me personally, wanted to know how we could make this happen and make this a great a merger. So I think that commitment from the company that was acquiring us actually helped tip it a little. But when you were looking, when, when was, were there other companies that were also pitching you at the time? So periodically, um, you know, companies would come in and they'd start to talk to you about buying you. And, you know, it was one company we said we'd rather die first than be bought from because they were just rude. Um, and you don't want to tell us who that is, I suppose. I can't tell you who that was. It was like being at The Hague. Um, so, yeah, we had a bunch of offers and, you know, sort of people looking at us as we went along. And we were really focused on, you know, growing the company. Um, We'd never discarded an acquisition, but we hadn't pursued it either. So when, when you went to the negotiation table with, with Dell and the numbers started floating up over that B number, I mean, what was your reaction of you and your, your, your fellow founders? I mean, were you like, oh my gosh, you know, was that, what happened with that? So it was sort of funny. So I wasn't in the immediate negotiations. I was running product at the time. And so I'm at... Um, so I worked like all the time. So anybody here is a founder knows they work all of the time. So I'm at my son's, um, you know, parents weekend for his freshman year in college. And they're calling me and they said, it's over a B now. Should we do it? I'm like, but I'm hearing my son present. <laughs> right. So the priorities, right? right. So priorities. It's like, well, tell me when you guys decide what you want to do. Anything over a B seems like we should be having the discussion. So I wasn't as engaged in it as I probably should have been. I was, you know, watching my son's, um, material science experiment at CMU, learning about helicopter parents, which I was trying not to be one of, <laughs> right? So um, I remember at one point they called and asked me a question. I said, aren't there any other founders who can answer this? So, um, you know, I got back on that Sunday night and then I started to be involved, but I wasn't in the last nuances of the details. Yeah, maybe that was better that you were caught up in something else at that point, right? Um, so you're CEO at Data Gravity and you've held certainly held a lot of high-level management positions, but as you just uh, alluded to, you weren't CEO at, at the first company. So how is it different, you know, being CEO of a startup as opposed to being part of the management and founding team of a startup? 
Well, I got a little bit of a taste of CEO at Equalogic. I was um, acting CEO for a couple quarters, um, and I really enjoyed it. But the company was growing faster than my ability to, you know, to learn all the roles. Right. Um, and so I decided that if I started another one, you know, I feel passionately about the company, passionately about how we're positioned in the market, and I understand the business and the technology. So I said I would do the CEO role. What I found, though, is in product, you care about product and people. As CEO, you care about people and people. Right. So CEO is much more a people-driven job than a, and a, you know, both jobs are very focused on customer. It's much more a people-driven job than a product-driven job. It was these, as CEO, though, is there more day-to-day um, -day pressure in terms of making sure that all the pieces are moving and working in cohesion? Um, for whatever reason, I felt that pressure as a founder at Equalogic. I felt like, you know, the Equalogic success was shared by a lot of people, but if we failed, it would have been my fault. Right. Um, so for me, the pressure is about the same because you've asked your friends to join you and you're responsible for their livelihood. And then you've asked people to invest in you, you know, and there are, you know, you know, there are limiteds with retirement funds and college funds. And so you're very responsible for that, that money you took and to make sure, you know, you're affecting people's livelihood. I mean, it seems right. like it's a, it's a race, but you're affecting people's livelihood by the decisions you make, and I take that pretty seriously. So, so how does that fear of failure, how does that drive a founder? I think it's a healthy fear. Um, if any founder's not worried every day, then they're focused on the wrong things, because you're playing chess and checkers at the same time. You're trying to figure out what your next move is, and then you're also worried about, you know, so, so what am I going to do in six months or a year? Because you've got to set yourself up for that. So there's, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun, but there's a lot of responsibility. So you've got to take it very seriously. Right. So I'm um, just going back to that sale for a minute. Um, that was at the end of 2007. We were starting to get the first rumblings of the meltdown that was to come in 2008. Uh, a few of the mortgage companies had thrown up, you know, some pretty big red flags. And you guys were navigating a billion dollar sale in the middle of all that. Did that have any impact on the negotiations, that kind of economic climate, or what did the company want you and it didn't matter? So we were in a, um, in a market that didn't get as affected as others by the recession. So storage, data storage still is something you have to have. No one wants to delete their files. No one wants to delete their email. Everybody needed databases. So if you were to look at the companies that were impacted by the recession, the data storage companies weren't impacted as greatly and came back quicker. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that we were as worried about that. I think what we were thinking about was, you know, Dell wants to get into this business. So did two other firms who were also talking to us. Do we want to, you know, with that kind of competition, or do we want to cooperate with them? And we went for cooperation. So. If you had waited, though, if you had waited six months, do you think it would have made a difference? Because then everything just sort of fell apart in the economy. Yeah, but if you think about it, three par waited, data domain was out public, Isilon was out public, and all three of them got bought for more than $2 billion. Um, so you could say we went too early. I was going to say, maybe I don't think, didn't I don't hold think, out for enough. Yeah. I think, you know, you have to decide what is a good point for you. I think some of the venture guys might say we went too early. I think... It's all just a balancing act. But all three of them were public at the time, and all three of them um, you know, experienced the dip and came out doing just great. So Data Gravity is your second company. And I'm wondering, as a founder, what was it like launching a company a second time? And just out of curiosity, as successful as Equalogic was, knowing what you knew the second time, were there things that you said, I'm never going to do this if I get a chance to do this again? And what kind of things might those be? Yep, so um, launching the second time is pretty interesting because, you know, we had just, so I've been in startups that succeeded, I've been in startups that failed. So f success is more fun, by the way. <laughs> um, sure. But uh, so when you're starting to think about doing your next one, you're saying, okay, so this is my legacy now. I just left, you know, with what, you know, arguably was a home run, lots of happy customers, great culture in the company, you know, good uh, monetary exit for both the employees and the investors. So... Now you say to yourself, okay, do I have an idea that's big enough? And so it took me a long time to find an idea that I thought was big enough. And data gravity is going to change storage in a very fundamental way. 
because right now storage doesn't know anything about the data it holds. And for security, data privacy, and just finding things and efficiency, storage needs to know about the data it holds. So, so I was pretty sure that I was onto a great idea. Um, I got a great co-founder in John Joseph, who I'd worked with at um, Equalogic. And the one thing I said I wouldn't do is I wouldn't, um, you know, as I started to raise money, I would make sure that, you know, I, I picked the partners I wanted. I was very careful about how we went across, um, how we were going to grow the company, that we would really focus on making sure, you know, Equalogic, we were focused on customer, we've doubled down with data gravity. Um, and I think, you know, Equalogic was, you know, we ramped, you know, aggressively but cautiously. Data gravity, we're ramping successfully but cautiously. So I think the one thing we didn't do um, was we had no infrastructure at Equalogic. So, you know, when we, you know, when we started selling, we had people manually putting in POs and we couldn't put them in fast enough. So we put in a little bit more infrastructure, but other than that, it's pretty much the same playbook. So when you, when you sold Equalogic, it was 2007, the cloud wasn't even you know, on people's radar, most people. I mean, AWS was still a small operation for Amazon, and there weren't a lot of cloud discussions, especially in the enterprise. Um, how had the storage market changed between the time you sold Equalogic and the time you started Data Gravity in 2012? Um, I think there's a few things that have changed. First of all, Equalogic was one of the first companies that was going to sell to the mid-tier through the channel, um, and now everybody's doing that. Uh, we were one of the first people who were doing all-inclusive, so once you bought the product, you got all the features. Now everybody's doing that. Um, you know, cloud was, you know, a term in 2007, 2008, but nobody was really doing it. And what you're finding is the cloud is a great place when the application and the storage are together. It's a great place for DR. Um, not such a great place if the application and the storage are, are separated by some distance hence the gravity comment. Mm -hmm. um, also, depending on what regulatory information you have with the data or the amount of data, the cost of the cloud isn't as cheap as you think. Right. So there's a, there's a balancing act. I think it's going to be a hybrid for a long time. So we're, we're fresh off the Alan Powell trial. The gender conversation is definitely prevalent right now. And I'm wondering, given your experience, how has the conversation on gender changed from when you started in the early 2000s to 2015 when you're a female CEO? So that's really a good question. I have sort of an unfair advantage um, in that I was responsible for the most part in coming up with the idea and the strategy. So I've been treated pretty equally. I mean, it's hard for everybody, but I don't think that my gender has hurt me. And in some cases, it's cool to be a chick right now in tech, <laughs> so you can take advantage of that a little bit. So a little bit you can actually take advantage of. Sorry, ladies. Um, but, uh, you know, so I'd say at the moment it's more of an advantage than a disadvantage. I mean, I get invited to all kinds of stuff because I need a girl. Um, I shouldn't say that here, <laughs> should I? Um, but at any rate, so I haven't seen it as a disadvantage, right? But then, you know, I'm pretty, you know, forthright. You can't shock me. I say what I think. I'm not necessarily intimidated. Um, and so I also started doing startups in my 30s. I don't know how I'd have felt in my 20s. All right. Right, I was more confident when I came out of the gate. So I don't know how it felt if I started in my 20s. So um, getting back to data gravity for a second, I mean, you, you, you alluded to this a little bit, but it combines storage, protection, governance, search, and a single appliance that you install in a data center. And in some senses, that's bucking current trends, right? Because as we talked about, there's the cloud as a storage option which more and more companies are using. And there's even a movement away from hardware appliances to software appliances, you know, so you don't even have a physical entity. So you're bucking those trends. Why, why did you go that route, and how is that um, helping you as a company? So first of all, software-defined storage still has to run on hardware. Right. And what you find is a lot of companies come start out with software-defined storage, and then they realize that the hardware compatibility list is so complicated that they end up selling it on storage. And also companies that buy storage want one throat to choke. They don't want to go to one person for the hardware and have the software people sort of pointing fingers at them. They want just a solution. Um, I think where you know, there's quite a bit of on-prem and it'll stay on-prem. 
you know, for the foreseeable future because of performance, because of security, because of convenience, um, because of storage has become much simpler to manage, so the amount of people to manage per, per terabyte is much less than it was in the past. That said, I think as storage moves to the cloud, you're going to see it as a metro cloud. So a lot of the managed service Do you provided. Mean by that term? Yeah. So what you're going to see is a lot of the resellers are going to become managed service providers, where they're a trusted partner to the um, to the company that's buying the storage, and they'll host the storage. So it'll be off-prem. It's sort of like a private cloud, but hosted right. by someone else. Because frankly, if if your data is unavailable, people wonder whether Amazon really cares, right. um, or wonders whether or not you know Google really cares. They care. But you know, you've got two terabytes, and someone else has a petabyte, and they've got a whole infrastructure. People want to know who's the custodian of their data. But given the, the you know the, the the downward push of the cost of storage in the cloud, uh, and the increasing competition amongst Amazon and Azure and 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 Google Cloud, um, is it hard for a company like yours to compete with those numbers? Well, you have to remember those numbers are per month. And those numbers don't include the cost to read it. So you can check it out anytime you like. You can never leave. So it's, <laughs> it's expensive to go ahead if you're going to read all the data again, because you're charged for reading at some of the sites. Um, there's connection costs. So you really have to do the math on how active the data is. If the data is active, then leaving it on-prem is likely less expensive. If the data is inactive, then putting it in the cloud is probably less expensive. So it's, it's going to be a hybrid. So um, last year at, at TC Disrupt San Francisco, I interviewed Scott Deaton, who's the CEO of Pure, who I know you know. And I asked him a question about being sold. You know, I said, what was the number that would, that would make you say, oh, wait, I've got to do it? And he said, he's, he's started a number of companies, and his quote was, being sold sucks. And I was wondering what it was like after running your own startup. I mean, you said that Michael Dell was very supportive, but becoming a part of this huge corporation, did it take the starch out of your, your startup energy? So I was there for two years after the acquisition. Um, and I can tell you that we were on the same mission with a better arms dealer. <laughs> um, we went from you know, like 140 trailing revenue to, you know, a number that had lots of zeros beyond that, um, you know, after the two years. I saw uh, a real passion to get this right, and I saw a real commitment. So I'd say 90% of the experience was amazing, and I'd say there was the 10% welcome to a big company. Um, you know, sign off on this, sign off on that. But for the most part, we were innovating and staying on our roadmap with extra resources. So I don't know if we were the anomaly or not, but I was in another company called Bright Tiger that got bought by Allaire at the time back in the 90s, early 2000, and the same thing happened. If you go in with the attitude that we're going to make this work, and then the trick is, if the company that bought you actually makes money, um, you know, then everybody's happy, happy. Because right? we had yeah. one of the best... Um, margins, one of the best, you know, synthetic operating incomes. So we got to be special because of those. So, so with that experience, I mean, you obviously had a good experience. So would that influence in any way? I mean, obviously we were just talking about it backstage. Data Gravity is only three years old. It's still very much in, in a growth phase. But would it influence how you would handle an exit from Data Gravity, you know, knowing what you know now? So we're going for lots of happy customers. Um, we probably go public, um, but who knows? It's just way too early to know those kind of kind of things. So when we're at you know a couple hundred million dollars in revenue and multiple thousands of happy customers, we'll have choices. I wouldn't rule out either one, but you know we're going as if we're you know we're going to be a big public concern. We have right. a big enough idea to go public. That's the point you have to think about. If you're if you're just a commodity, you need to think about being acquired because eventually you're going to get crushed. But we have a big enough idea and a broad enough roadmap that we can be a big public company. We're not a one-trick pony. Right. So we have less than a minute. I want to ask you one quick question. Your company lets people have insight into their data. Tell me one great insight that the customer was able to get because it, they were using your product. So we've seen lots of different things. People have found um, privacy issues that would have cost them fines that were more than the product. People have found when people were leaving the company, um, somebody was uh, data dumping and taking their data with them. 
people have found, you know, old reports, old presentations they didn't even know where they were. People have been able to trend, you know, POs against regions right from within their data. So they're learning about the good stuff and being able to capitalize on it, and they're making sure that there's no downside in their data. So if they get audited, they're clean. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great conversation. Thank you.